Hi everyone, and welcome to the Gehana Konta podcast, your dose of relaxpiration where we get to meet amazing people from sport, business, entertainment, and just life in general. In this episode, we answer your questions and speak to Formula One team Williams Racing's deputy team principal, Claire Williams. I loved chatting to Claire so much that I've split the interview across this and another bonus episode, so there's plenty more to come. I'm your host, Johanna Konta, and welcome to episode two, part one. Ahead of each episode, I will be asking you to submit questions to me on Twitter or Instagram, where you can find me at Johanna Conta. Feel free to ask me anything you like, tennis related, travel related, Bono related. Love Bono questions, but honestly, anything. Thank you so much to everyone who sent in their questions. There were loads. So let's get started. First up this week is a question from Felipe who asked, what is your favorite moment from the Rio 2016 Olympics? Well, I mean, I've always said that honestly, being a part of Team GB in Rio, it has definitely been one of the most significant and incredible experiences of my sporting career, but also just my life in general. It was such a monumentous kind of just bigger than any individual person kind of experience for me. It was honestly just incredible to be surrounded by athletes from all different disciplines and for everyone to have this vested interest in just trying to really make Team GB and make Great Britain at home proud. So just in general, the whole experience was was incredible. But in terms of maybe a match for me, I'd have to say actually, and then the post-match bit, I'd I'd have to say when I played my round of 16 match against Kuznetsova and it was a really, really tough match. It was, I think, I mean, I think it was over three hours, maybe coming up to three and a half hours long. It was a very physically demanding, mentally demanding, just high quality match. So it was also really fun to be a part of it. And then obviously it was incredibly fun to win it. (laughs) That's for sure. But then what really took me by surprise was actually when I went back to where the whole team GB was actually housed. When I got back there, I had athletes from all different disciplines coming up to me and saying, congratulations, we were rooting for you. And that was, that just blew my mind just to have so many other athletes being vested in 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 wanting me to do well and and I mean I obviously returned the favor in so many different sports when I was shouting at the at our little tv screens and wanting everyone to do well so yeah that was probably the most surreal experience for me the next question is from Alan who asked how is Bono well you know Alan I ask this question regularly how is Bono how how is Bono and I think generally generalize like kind of generalizing his well-being he's pretty good he's actually meant like he it's a dog's life here in the Conta household um but no I think how Bono is is adjusting to life with a younger brother um Gizmo who I think um definitely takes a lot of energy out of him which is good for mum and dad at home for us because it means that we aren't as busy with them um but otherwise I think Bono is just generally just an absolute specimen of a brilliant dog and I absolutely adore him. So he is very well, thank you very much for asking. Robin asks next, what kind of car do you drive? So I actually um, work with Jaguar as one of my partners, which I feel very, very blessed with. And so right now I drive an F-Pace, absolutely love it. Um, But hopefully, hopefully one day soon, I'll get a chance to drive their electric car because it's really cool. So I'm kind of hoping that one day soon I'll be driving that one. Moving on now to a question from Charlie, who asked, what's your favorite match of your career so far? Um, Well, that's a hard one because, I mean, I think as you go through your career, you experience incredible matches, or I've been very fortunate to have experienced incredible matches at different stages. But I think probably my most recent favorite match, um, probably the round of 16 match at US Open. I'd been in the round of 16 at the US Open a couple times before and have come up short in making it to the 
you know, to the quarterfinals there. So to be able to do that last year and um, also against a player who I haven't beaten very many times um, against Karolina Pliskova, she's definitely gotten the better of me more so than not. So hopefully I've started a bit of a good run. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that definitely is probably my favorite match um, to date so far, or most recently anyway. It was it just felt so nice to finally make it to um, the last date um, at the US Open as well. And finally, a question from Mike, who asked, can you tell us about the Sinta Tantra painting you have? Was it a gift for a special occasion? I love her work. Well, I absolutely love her work too. Um, but actually, no, it wasn't a gift. I um, randomly was walking by a gallery and I just saw this painting and it was still not too far into living in the apartment that I'm living in now. And I, I still had a lot of space on on the walls and my boyfriend and I would been looking at to what you know what kind of we wanted to put in those spaces and I just got taken with this with this painting I, I just absolutely loved it from the get-go and I literally walked in and I said can I please have that <laughs> um, so yeah no I, I, I paid full price and it <laughs> it's worth every penny that's for sure um, but uh, yeah I absolutely love the painting and it literally sits above uh, my uh, dining table um, and yeah no I get I get a lot of a lot of questions about it from anyone who come who comes here mainly my parents and my boyfriend's parents they they don't seem to understand it but they don't need to it's it's my love <laughs> thank you again to everyone who submitted questions as each episode comes i'll be answering more so please keep sending them in via social media this week my guest is claire williams Claire is the deputy team principal of the British Formula One team Williams Racing, which was founded in the 70s by Sir Frank Williams. Alongside becoming deputy principal in 2013, Claire has been appointed an OBE in 2016, as well as acting as vice president for the Spinal Injuries Association. I'm incredibly excited and humbled to have the opportunity to speak to her today. Welcome to the show, Claire, and thank you so much for coming on. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I feel enormously privileged to be doing your podcast. I'm very excited. Oh, no, don't be silly. I, it's like, honestly, I, I feel giddy with excitement. I'm so glad you came on. And <laughs> we actually met at Silverstone, which was, I, on, I kid you not, one of the best days of my life. Thank you again <laughs> so much for inviting me down. It's a, it's a real pr pleasure. We, um, we loved having you. And to be honest, it was the highlight of my weekend having you there because Mark and I had just gone to see um, you play at Wimbledon a few weeks beforehand, hadn't we? And I know that you were obviously knocked out and hugely disappointed, but we were so, like, I was blown away by your performance there and I was so excited about meeting you. It genuinely was the highlight of my weekend. <laughs> oh, no, please don't say that because honestly, like, I thought I literally was living on cloud nine and obviously it was disappointing for me to to lose at Wimbledon. However, I was still proud that I made it to the quarters and but then literally two days later, I'm like getting on a helicopter to like fly into Silverstone and then I'm like in the pit stop, like going on the grid. I'm like, oh my God gosh, whose life am I living? <laughs> like, like, literally. It is an extraordinary world, Formula One. Um, you know, and I never take it for granted when I'm there. And you, like you say, we, we took you on the grid. And I've been racing now for 20 years. I've only just started going on the grid about seven or eight years ago. And I never forget how lucky I am because it really is just the most extraordinary thing to be able to do. And it's great to take people onto it that haven't been on it because it's so frenetic there. It's so exciting ahead of the start of a Grand Prix to see everything that's going on and the crowds and particularly the crowds at Silverstone they're, they're fantastic so to be a part of that's just brilliant I mean it's incredible I just remember the heat coming off the track and and like I just the whole thing was so breathtaking already and like the race hadn't even started and actually I probably experienced my best photo bomb ever there because when when you and I were taking a photo Frank was actually chatting to Michael Douglas in the background and I I don't think I'll ever ever get such a good photo bomb ever again yeah I have that picture on my phone it was brilliant <laughs> I'm with you on that. And I remember we watched the entire race from the pits and it was amazing to see the pit stop so close up to be stood with the team, hearing the engines. Like you said, you are still forever grateful for that and privileged, but do you still get the same buzz each race? 
I do. Um, you know, I like I said, I never take for granted the job that I have. And my dad's always said to me, you know, aren't we lucky we get paid to do something that we love and probably something that we do if we weren't paid because we do just love what we do. And, you know, to be in the garage during a, a Grand Prix is amazing. I have to say at the moment with um, where we are performance wise, it's not particularly as exciting as it used to be. You know, gone are the days of um, the magical days of 2014 and 15 where, you know, we would be fighting with the Mercedes for podium positions. And that was really, you know, quite stomach churning I think and certainly when we were leading the British Grand Prix what in when was it 2015 I think it was that was really pretty terrifying so sat there now watching your cars going around at the back of the grids not not a whole lot of fun but you still can't take away the enormity of it and I just love being in the garage with my team that's where that's kind of my happy place I think um you know apart from being at home with my family being amongst my work family and those guys that do what they do and and what Watching what they do I'll spend an awful lot of time just sat in the garage on my little stool watching them work behind the scenes between sessions and you know working on the car how they understand how that car goes together um, it just blows my mind every time I watch them I mean if we have an accident and I see what they do in such a short period of time to get the car back up and running um, I can just be mesmerized by that for hour upon hour I th think that they think I'm a complete weirdo sat there staring at them all <laughs> but I just find it fascinating what they do oh, and no. what they what they know no but for sure but also with with just the depth of knowledge you have of the sport I guess growing up in the sport with obviously Williams Racing being created by your father and he's still the team principal from what I understand mm. What is your earliest memory of Formula One? Because like you said, I mean, the way you speak about it, it's so full bodied. What, what is it? What was it like growing up in a household that was such an integral part of the sport? Yeah, again, I use the word privilege a lot, but it, it was a true privilege. And, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And I, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily think um, what an extraordinary world you're a part of when you're little. But certainly now I think to myself, wow, God, how lucky am I that I was born into you know, our family and I got to experience that. And we got to experience an awful lot of it because my father certainly wasn't a father that left his work in the office when he left. He brought it all home with him. And my mother was hugely involved in discussions and conversations that were going on. And we'd have supper every night together, um, the five of us. And we'd all sit there and kind of overhear mom and dad's conversations about what was going on. And you know, drivers would come to the house if they were interviewing in inverted commas for a race seat with my dad for the team um, and to see those kinds of things I remember you know Nigel Mansell flying in in a helicopter into our you know, back garden and to have Sunday lunch with my mom and dad and you know just extraordinary people coming around and and seeing that you take it for granted at the time and then when you look back on it you're like my god that was incredible I wish I could relive it and be more cognizant of the whole experience I suppose but you know, as much as dad used to bring his work home he didn't really take his family traveling with him it wasn't his thing he liked to get on the plane by himself and leave us all behind and you know, quite <laughs> rightly so I don't think you should you know, necessarily be dragging your family around racing with you it's still a work environment and um, so we got to go to only a handful of races and really only the British Grand Prix itself and they were a big treat for us and you know, there would be a lot of preparation um, for our Silverstone trips and outfits chosen and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, you know, incredible. rules and regulations on best behavior. And we were always put to work. I was always on tea making and sandwich making duty in our, <laughs> in our little trucks that we used to have as motorhomes then. Um, yeah, it was it was a great experience. I'm, I'm oh. incredibly lucky and I recognize that. That's so incredible. And you say, so your, your, your dad would go off and obviously on, on, on his work trips, but because you, like you said, you, you spoke about around, around the dinner table and, and your mum was so involved in discussions as well. Did you ever find yourself then, I guess, in front of the TV watching the races and just being wrecked with nerves? Like I imagine actually my family is when they are at home and they're watching me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine what that must be like for your parents. <laughs> um, pressure must be extraordinary. Um, it's easier when you're involved, isn't it? Because you don't, you, you feel your own pressure. But I think for those watching you, it must be quite terrifying. Um, I don't think I did. When I was little, I didn't sit there um, and really watch a whole lot of races. I went to boarding school and you know, it wasn't back then. They weren't, we weren't allowed to watch TV um, really at the weekend. There were activities and stuff. And so I missed a lot of it. And the first I ever really 
heard of what happened over a race weekend was when I managed to get hold of a newspaper on a Monday morning and see, you know, read the the sports pages at the back and scour to find out where we'd finished. Um, so I didn't really sit there a whole lot um, and watch the races. The only times that I did is if, if I was at home on a weekend out of boarding school and my mum and my brother and I would sit there and watch it. But my mum never let us let us speak um, while watching a race. There were strict instructions on when you were and la- weren't allowed to get up and what you were and weren't allowed to do while a Grand Prix was on in our house. And that continued right up until, um, God, up until a few years ago when we'd still watch them at home sometimes with my mum. She was very strict about that and keeping quiet <laughs> while the racing business was happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's so incredible, honestly. Um, and with Williams having such an incredible history and, and racing pedigree, and, and like you said, the incredible results that were um, achieved not that long ago and, and still very much possible to be achieved, do you feel things differently during the ups and downs of competing than, say, a team member who isn't a part of the literal family, just because you literally, it's in your, it's in your blood and bones, literally. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it more of a career for them? Um. I think you'd probably, if you asked anyone at Williams how they felt um, on each and every race weekend and whether the team's doing well or not, they probably feel it as keenly. Um, I think there's probably maybe a little more emotion for me because, like you said, it's it's been you know my entire life and it's so um, it, it kind of defines us as a family because my dad brought his work home and we were so close to it and have been so close to it for all of our lives it's quite difficult to differentiate yourself from the team and almost have your own personality we're kind of defined by you know this incredible race team that we have and you know the highs are extraordinarily high when they come and you know thinking back to the start of my tenure as deputy team principal and um, you know, we had two incredible years, in fact, if not, you know, four incredible years. And I wish that I'd taken um, or paid more attention to the um, just the amazingness of those years. You know, we were on, I was going down to the podium to see Valtteri and Felipe on the podium pretty much every race weekend. And, you know, it, it almost came to the point where I'd be like, oh, God, do I have to walk all the way down there again? <laughs> Which is awful. And now, my God, I think back and I think, oh, God, can I have those moments back? Because now it's so painful to to go through this period. And it certainly was incredibly difficult in 2019 um, or the start of it in 2018 when the team was in really bad shape. But we were unable to do a whole lot about it at the time. And it was only really at the back end or through the um, halfway point of 2019 that we were actually able for a variety of reasons to start making the turnaround changes that we needed to and I think from there I got you know the buzz back again it was kind of okay I can get the bit between my teeth again and I can do what I need to do to you know turn this team around I'd done it in 2013 I inherited a team in that year that had finished ninth eighth and ninth and I we took it to third for two consecutive years in 14 and 15 and you know, when you're able to actually start affecting change and putting the plans in place to drive performance, that is what that challenge is what really drives me. And then you know, obviously this year we weren't able to see because of coronavirus the the effects of that change. And yeah, so for me it's in, it's incredibly personal and it's incredibly emotive. And but if I have if I if I have got to do the job that I need to do, I, I, I have to try and leave the emotions um, at the door when I walk in through um, to my office or to the racetrack because it can get quite difficult at times if I allow my my emotions and my family connection to get too much in the way. It can be a bit tricky sometimes. No, for sure. And, and like you said, with, with the highs and lows, I mean, for me in my career, I guess in sport in general, you the highs are always incredibly high and the lows are incredibly low. I remember my my boyfriend's actually first tournament when he came with me was he came to the Miami Open and it was the year that I won it. And I remember him actually talking about it with me years after saying, I really didn't appreciate that because I was like, oh, like this is just normal. You show up and you just win the whole event. And obviously I haven't, I haven't won a tournament since, but I've had very high highs since. But he's, he's said to me, you know, next time I win a tournament, I'm really going to appreciate that and, and it's true you don't you don't always recognize I guess how incredible the highs are or well, at least not for some time I think that comes with time literally in the sport in experiencing both and mm-hmm. you kind of appreciate both for what they are Absolutely. But, you also, but you also touched on well for me actually my team is relatively small so it's also an easier environment in terms of to 
control everyone's emotions it's 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 quite tight knit what's it like for you navigating through this whole thing with such a big company and of made up of so many people and making sure everyone is just as invested as the people on the track how do you nurture that approach yeah that's um, a big piece of work that um the kind of the mantle that i took on um as part of the transformation process that uh, we started in 2019 and it became really apparent that the culture at Williams wasn't where we needed it to be in order to be successful. And culture, as you know, Joe, in any size team in sport is absolutely critical. And I don't think sometimes people put a huge amount of emphasis on that. Invariably, it's the one thing where it certainly used to be that kind of was the last thing that you thought about. But for me, culture and engendering a really powerful culture is absolutely critical if you're going to be successful. A team is not going to be successful if it doesn't have a strong culture within it. Um, and we did a, we had our first employee engagement survey in 2018 or 2019, I think it was probably quite late to the party. And um, the results of those were pretty scary for me, I have to say, with disengagement levels. Um, and so off the back of that, we embarked on this major cultural transformation program that is now wrapped up in what we call Next Gen Williams. And I think for me, because I'd seen the culture that we had at Williams in our winning days and, you know, a culture that was really engendered by Frank and Patrick when they were running the team. And you know, if you talk to Frank and Patrick now about what they did in order to generate this incredible culture they'll go what are you talking about culture for you know what is that I don't understand you know what you're talking about they just did it and I think a lot of that great culture comes from strong successes um, in your sport and you know success breeds success doesn't it and it, and it creates a good culture and a, a great working environment and but that had been so important to me because everyone had always talked about this culture that Frank and Patrick had created and you know the spirit within Williams and I felt that it was dissipating somewhat and so we put in place this next gen program in order to try and rebuild that culture but it is incredibly difficult to do when you've got a team the size of ours and you know our team is nearly 700 people strong on the F1 side of the business and to try and you know build a culture and drive a culture through so many people is always an incredible challenge but it was one that we embarked upon and one that we will never give up on because driving a great culture is something that you have to do each and every each and every day and it's certainly driven from the top but you need cultural ambassadors through your organization you need to just keep pounding the message into your people what the kind of culture is that you want to create and everybody needs to live and breathe that if they're going to be successful no for sure I mean for me I know it's when I look for the people that I'm working with I look for a a similar approach and mindset and um, also priorities are very important but for me it's on a small scale it's for the, for the people that I'm in contact with daily like you said you, I think you said 700 people I I mean I don't think you are in touch with all 700 people every single day or are you? <laughs> well no no and clearly I couldn't be but it is um, it's really important to me that um, I know as many of those people as I can and I understand their issues and actually interesting you say that but a big the first part of the puzzle of this um, next gen program that we put in place was if we don't understand how our people are feeling and what they think about Williams and what they do or don't have in order to do the job that we're asking them to do, we're not going to be able to change things because change comes from within and from within each and every person that you have on your team. So I set about a program of talking to each and every single individual within our team, but I did it in groups. I couldn't do it yeah, individually. That would probably take me five years to do something like that. So I, I got groups of 20 people together um, and I did you know three or four sessions a week um, for a couple of hours at a time and I talked to all of those people about the good the bad and the ugly about what was going on and we had so many actions to take away from all of those meetings I think something like four or five hundred actions some were easy you know please fix the bathrooms they're not working very well and some were more <laughs> strategic and you know, it's even the small things like that that you know annoy people they come to work and they don't have great facilities to use and so you've got to fix it or they can't order the the nuts that they need to do the job that they've got to do that you're asking them to do and it's it's frustrating for people and so if you can dial out as many of those frustrations and make the processes easier and give them you know the some of the luxuries that they'd like to see like a good gym and great food in the canteen that all small you know small steps goes to build a really strong culture so I did go and talk to all of those people and we we did that we listened 
and we fed back all the changes that we've made. And now I, well, actually at the start of this year, I'd started to do the second wave of those and talk to everybody again. Um, but unfortunately with coronavirus, that's rather scuppered my plans a little bit. And yeah. I can't talk to them right now. <laughs> and that's so interesting that you said that because also when you talk about the culture and what Frank and Patrick brought, but they obviously weren't conscious of the culture that they were, I guess, naturally producing. I think it's such a different beast when you are consciously going into it with a plan and an action. And I think... I, I, I'm actually in awe of you because that is something that I, I truly believe personally lasts longer and it's actually that is your legacy because if you are literally putting the building blocks in, in for something that whoever comes after you or later will be able to always refer back to that because you're basically giving a roadmap for how this can be achieved and how this can grow mm. whereas yeah. sometimes in sport as we know it's also luck and so to, to really take that into hand honestly I'm in, I'm in, I'm in such awe of that. No, not to, you know, it actually stems from a bit of jealousy because it was kind of like, my God, how did my dad manage to create this amazing culture and he didn't even know he was doing it? <laughs> so I need to create my own culture at Williams and, and to you know, breathe a bit of my own kind of life into the place and what, you know, the, the, the standards that I live by and how I want to see this moving forward. But I also did it for him as well. You know, a lot of people come and work um, at Williams because of Frank and I wanted to ensure that the next generation of people that work for Williams um, understood what William stands for and that's really important to me as much as you know making sure that I did a, a good job because I was a little bit jealous of the culture that my father created. No for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Separately from that so for me when I'm when I'm competing and I'm I'm the only person on the court so it's my decisions my approach that I can try and control I, I, I emphasize try <laughs> um, but in your sport there are so many things outside of your personal control how do you regulate that when you just can't personally jump in the car yourself yeah that's um that's quite difficult it's like you say joe you're on the court it's you you you're making your decisions the the pressure is all on you and and i suppose there's therefore different pressure isn't there but when you know i'm not the person that's designing the aero upgrade or i'm not the person on the pit wall making the calls as to when we're going to bring the car in and um sometimes wrong decisions are made and uh, you know that's just human nature or it's just how a race may go you might suddenly decide to bring your car in but the next you know the next lap there's a big accident and there's a safety car or the rain suddenly comes down and then clearly that's not the best decision that you would have you would have made um so it, it's not easy to kind of control the fact that you're not in control and control your emotions but you have to do it i made some mistakes in my early days where I would go storming over to the pit wall at the end of the race and scream <laughs> my head off at them going, what the hell were you playing at? But you know, you can't be an armchair you know, quarterback in this kind of world that we live in. It's such a fast paced environment. You know, everybody is having to make decisions within you know split seconds um, in order to drive performance. And I just know, and I trust in my team that they will always make there and then on the spot, the best decisions or the thing, what they think are the best decisions for the team. No one goes out of their way to make mistakes or makes, make an incorrect decision. And so because of that trust, I know that they did the best job at the moment, in the moment for the team and therefore there can't be any comeback for that. Um, and at the end of the day, we are one team. We're in this together and we are all human. And at some point, someone's going to make a mistake. But it's actually about how you react to those mistakes that you do and, and will make during a Grand Prix weekend. How you react to those is so important. It's about learning from them. It's not about turning on somebody. It's about learning for them, putting in different procedures for the next time. I remember we had an awful incident a few years ago where we had, um, a, a, I think it was Valtteri came in for a pit stop. And one of the tyres, um, we put the wrong tyre on the car. <laughs> so, you know, the, all the tyres are colour-coded and it, the car went out with like three yellow tyres and one white tyre. <laughs> and, you know, it's there for the whole world to see and you're like, oh my God, you, know, you just want to curl up and die because the whole world's watching you and you're supposed to be at the highest echelon of your sport and not make such a ridiculous decision. But as I say, we're all humans and no one's going to go about doing that, you know, intentionally. It's just a mistake and you, you learn from it and you never make the same mistake again. And that's what's so important to me and, and the trust that I have in the team. And, and that's how I can control my feelings on any given day. 
Oh, no, for sure. I mean, the amount of times I've had to ask team members and family members to go back to the hotel to pick up things for me that I forgot, <laughs> like wristband, wristbands, yeah. a sports drink, literally everything. And I'm like thinking, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. What's <laughs> wrong with me? <laughs> Thank you to everyone for listening to episode two, part one. Part two is now available where you can hear more of my incredible guest, Claire Williams. Make sure you check it out. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends, shatter to from the rooftops. You don't have to, but follow me across social media at Johanna Conta, where you can see some of the behind the scenes and mainly photos of my dogs. Yep, lots of puppy spam.